Good morning, everyone. It's great to see you all this morning. Well, I actually can't say that it's great to see you because I can't see you. I'm looking at a camera instead of seeing you in a lot of empty chairs. But what I do see is uh, the body of Christ scattered around our, com around our community, uh, trying to socially distance, trying to stay away from other people, but trying to be the gospel and the love of Christ where you are. And it's good to be able to know that today. I want to start with, the, uh, with a uh, call to worship from Psalm 25. And it says this, O Lord, we give our life to you. We trust in you, our God. You will not let us be disgraced. You will not let our enemies rejoice in our defeat. No one who trusts in you will ever be disgraced. But disgrace comes to those who try to deceive others. Show us the right path, O Lord. Point out the road for us to follow. Lead us by your truth and teach us. For you are the God who saves us. All day, every day, we put our hope in you. Let's pray to God. Father, we're so gracious, grateful today that we can gather in our living rooms and in our homes and we can watch together what you are trying to say to us today. Thank you. Thank you for this time of distancing and um, this time of, of challenge that it is to us. We may not be doing what we normally do, but we know we can serve you regardless. Thank you for that. As we worship this morning, as we celebrate what you have done, speak to us today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Sherry, Dave, Ken, would you lead us in the song?
It's a great song, telling us that life is worth living. And that chorus is really neat. Or actually, the second verse is really neat, where it says that we face uncertain days. Because we do face uncertain days. We don't know what tomorrow's going to bring. We don't know what next year's going to bring, or next week's going to bring, next month, or, or even next year. So we do face uncertain days. And we can trust that Jesus is going to lead us through them all, and we're grateful for that. As we uh, take a time for a confession this morning, I want to just read to you from Psalm 51. It's a powerful, powerful verse from verses that were written by David after he was confronted when he had uh, Bathsheba, he had, uh, he had had an affair with Bathsheba. And here's what he says when he was challenged by the prophet Nathan. He says, Have mercy on me, O God, according to your unfailing love, according to your great compassion, blot out my transgressions. Wash away all my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. For I know my transgressions and my sin is always before me. Against you and you only have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight. So you are right in your verdict and justified when you judge. You see, it's when we recognize what we've done, when we realize that we have sinned against the Holy God, it's our responsibility to come to Him and ask for forgiveness. The reality is we may sin against other people, but the truth is all of our sins are against God and God only. So with our heads and our hearts bowed, let us bring to God all that is in our hearts, our whole lives, and let us offer confession for of those who we are awaiting God's love and mercy. Let's pray silently together and then join me as I pray. Let's pray together. Great and gracious God, for apathy, for meanness, for boredom, for pride, for judgment, for dismissal, for all those we hurt by hurting you, hurting, all those we hurt you by hurting others and ourselves, forgive us. Turn us around to love, to heal, and to make us whole. We pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. So, my friends, sisters, and brothers in Christ, the mercies of God are from everlasting to everlasting, for we can proclaim together the good news that in Jesus Christ we are forgiven. Thanks be to God. Amen. I want to read to you, just uh, as we begin, I want to read to you from Matthew chapter 25, and uh, our message for today is called The Myths of the Resurrection. The Myths of the Resurrection. Because we often have some myths that are there. But let me read to you quickly. Matthew 28, verses 16 to the end of the chapter. Then the eleven disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain where Jesus had told them to go. When they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. Then Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I will be with you to the very end of the age. Some bits about the resurrection. Last week we celebrated and or, or celebrated Easter. Now I know it seems different that we celebrate it differently in our own homes or in our living rooms, wherever we happen to have been. But we celebrate it because the risen Lord Jesus can't be denied, and the Easter and Easter story can't be denied. But the problem happens is that we sometimes come with some different myths about the resurrection of Jesus. And I, I've come to find three different myths that are here in this passage. And if we remember this passage is very clear, we find this last little bit of the book of Matthew, the Gospel of Matthew, is the last few moments that Jesus is on earth here. It's the last few moments that he's spent with his disciples. Now we often refer to this as the Great Commission, and it is the Great Commission, and, a wonderful, and it's a wonderful Great Commission where Jesus says to his disciples, go, go. But what we also see here is a turning point, a turning point in the story that God is bringing to this earth. We've seen this turning point in a number of different places 
as we've watched this walk through the story of God over this last year, the last two years actually. We saw that right at the very beginning in Genesis chapter 3 where, where creation was, was dirty and sullied because of sin. And then we saw it with the birth of Christ not long ago where God began the process of redemption through Christ. And we see again a change here in this particular passage. Jesus is still there, and we're going to see about that in a moment. But we do find the focus shifts, not from Jesus and his ministry, but from the ministry of the eleven, and onward and onward from there. So the first myth that I often think that we come across as believers in Christ is this. The antidote for, true, for, proof, for uh, doubt is proof. In verse 16, Matthew records this. Then the eleven disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain where Jesus had told them to go. When they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. And we look at that, first as we read through this, we miss that last little phrase, but some doubted. We think, no, no, they shouldn't doubt. They had Jesus standing right there in front of them, right there, right at that moment. Jesus was there, they could reach out, they could touch him, they could hold him. Then why in the dickens would somebody doubt when the very presence of Jesus was there? But who exactly was doubting? Because we don't, they don't list, well it was Matthew, or it was you know, John, or it was James, or it was Andrew. No, no, they, they don't list those. Because it could have been some of those 11 disciples. But there was a, a crowd of other followers of Jesus who surrounded the disciples, and it could have been any one of them. But the question is, too, is what is the doubt that Matthew is talking about? The word here does not speak about unbelief, but about hesitation, as about uncertainty or un the unknown that they were facing. You see, the, we often think that the antidote for doubt is proof. And I've heard people say, if Jesus came and stand before me and I could touch him, then I would believe in him. Well, Thomas said the same thing. The disciples here were standing in front of Jesus and they could touch him. And still some of them doubted. You see, the antidote for doubt is not, is not proof. The antidote for doubt is faith. It's believing. It's recognizing that Jesus is more than just the figure standing in front of them. It's more than that. The antidote for proof, uh, for doubt, was the proof that Jesus was there would have dispelled anything, but it did not. It didn't. The truth of faith is that it can live with doubt, and doubt can live with faith. And you go, wait a minute, Pastor, that, that seems kind of strange. But is it? These disciples, these followers of Jesus who had walked with him all through their life believed, but there was hesitations. They weren't certain what the future was. They weren't certain what was going to happen. We can believe that God is in charge of our, of our days today, but yet we're uncertain. We don't know what stands ahead in this time of COVID-19. We don't know. Does that mean we doubt God? Not at all. But we do have hesitation. Doubt and faith can live together in the same person. So it's warning, if you're sitting there struggling and thinking, I don't know, I'm doubting, I'm not sure, I'm going to tell you, rest. Don't worry about it. Because God is the one that knows what's going to happen. And we trust Him, and we have faith in Him. We have faith in what Jesus is doing. He will walk with us. Mark Ryan tells a wonderful story. The story of a boy possessed by an evil spirit, and Jesus has brought, had the boy brought to him and asks, how long has he been like that? Now the, the father says, well, he's been like this since birth, and uh, in, in this, we've tried this and this and this, and we finally brought him to you, hoping there was something we could do. And Jesus responds to the father, and he says, do you believe? And he goes, yes, I believe. But help me with my unbelief. He believed that Jesus was powerful, that Jesus was able, but there was hesitation in his own life. And we may have that same hesitation when we look towards the future, uncertain about what's going to happen, 
uncertain about the next step, uncertain about when we're going to get back to church again, when we're going to get back to work again, uncertain about when our community is going to open up, when we're going to be able to go to Tim Hortons, when we're going to be able to get our hair cut. But we always know that Jesus is there, walking with us. That's a myth. Or that's the truth, not a myth. Now the second myth that we see here is that God's power is restricted by sin. We sort of think, oh, well, you know, sin is powerful, and it, it holds me back. It's, I struggle with it. I can't find myself getting over the problems that I have with sin. Well, in verse 17, verse 18, Jesus says this. Then Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. God's power is not restricted by sin. Here's what is powerful about this. There are four alls in this particular couple of words, couple of verses. He talks about all authority. Then he talks about all nations. Then he talks about all things. And he talks about all days. When Jesus says, all authority has been given to me, there is nothing on the face of this earth that doesn't, that takes away from that. Jesus' resurrection didn't bring the authority, not at all. What it did is it changed the realm of authority in which Jesus was able to exercise. It had gone from Galilee to Jerusalem, and now it was going to go to all of the heavens and earth, the everything. God's authority now came through and was mediated through Jesus Christ into this world. We often think of a police officer as somebody who is imbued with authority to act. And they do, to a certain degree. Their badge allows them to enforce the law, allows them to make arrests, allows them to do investigations. But their authority stops because they do not have the authority to convict somebody, to, to uh, punish somebody, or to send somebody to prison. That's not within the police jurisdiction. When Jesus says, all authority has been given to me, he means all authority. Nothing was held back. Everything was restricted, was allowed for him to do. God gave him that power to do it all. And now it was over all of the world. All authority. All nations. When Jesus spoke these words, I don't know if there was a uh, Tibet, as we know it, or a Colombia, or a Toronto. There was in 2,000 years ago. But when Jesus spoke these words, it was not just the nations surrounding him. It was not just the nations in, on, on that part of the world, but it was the nations over all of the globe. And not only over all of the globe, it was the nations all over the globe through all of time that would be affected. That when God gave Jesus the authority, he gave it over all nations, over all time, bar none. That was all given to Jesus for him to mediate. So 2,000 years ago, he saw what COVID-19 would do to a world, and he understood what would happen. And even then, he says, I have given all authority has been given to me. All nations. All things. We're afraid. Many people are afraid right now. You walk outside, you go to the store, and people kind of side-eye at you if you're standing a little too close for a moment, or they walk the other side of the street. We're afraid that fear is a big part of this whole, this whole COVID-19 thing. But all things, everything, has been given to Jesus. Everything has been put under that authority. Everything has been allowed, is, is there so that he knows what's going on. We may have been surprised by COVID-19 earlier this winter, but Jesus wasn't. We may point fingers and see where it starts and point to a place over in Wuhan province of China, and that's where it began. Jesus knows where it began. And he's not worried about that. You see, we think God's power is restricted by sin. God's power is restricted by nothing. All things, all nations. And the last thing, which is really powerful, is all days, all ways. There is no end to God's authority that is given to Jesus. It starts, it started when he was resurrected. It started then, but it will continue forever. It will continue to the end of days because it's all under his authority. There is no restriction 
of God's power in this world. There's no restriction right now, even to the church. The thing is, friends, we've been told we're not supposed to meet, and we respect what the government's asked us to do. But even more is that we are not under a restriction to worship. We worship at home, we worship in our living rooms on Sunday morning, maybe more than once, but we still worship. We share, we talk, we speak. Those are all important things that we can still do regardless. We can pick up the telephone and call. Those are things we can still do, and that's all service. Because God has not, his authority has not been dampened by sin, by a virus, by people. God's authority is still there. The third myth that I want to see is this. The Great Commission is meant for other people. Namely, we point to this first century text and say, only the disciples, only the disciples. Mm -mm. The therefore that comes at the beginning of verse 19 ties the authority that Jesus was given through the Father to the work that he was wanting his disciples to do. It is, he says, therefore, he says, go. Therefore, go. It's interesting as we talk about this. The idea of the word go, while it's a command, it is also a participle, not a verb. Which means that it says, the idea is while going. So while you are going about your days, while you are walking about your activities, while you are going into the world in which God has called you, while you are working, while you are serving, while you're taking care of your grandkids, while, while, while you are doing these things, he says, while you're doing that, baptize, teach, show. All of these things are so important for us to remember to do. Because the reality was, if it had to depend on 12 or 11 men in the first century, the church would have died out. But it began with 11 men that Jesus commissioned to go. And then it grew from that point to probably by the time of Constantine, around 300 AD, the Christian church might have been somewhere around the tune of 25 million people by that point. That's an incredible amount of growth. And today, 2,000 years over, the Christian church, while there has been a lot of apostasy at time, there have been a lot of questions, the Christian church is the, the, the largest religious organization, or largest religious group in, on the face of this earth. It's the Christian church. Now you and I as Christians in our culture, we go, well, I don't see much of that. And you know what, you're right. Why are we going? God has still called us as believers today to make a difference in the world in which we live. But pastor, I'm not called to baptize. No, you're not. Maybe you're not. But you are called to preach. You are called to share. You are called to live your life in such a way that people, that it points people to Jesus. You are called to be a witness for him wherever he has placed you. Maybe it's over on Elizabeth Street. Maybe it's on Bennett Street. Maybe it's over on Waterloo Street. Wherever God has placed you, He wants you to be a witness while you're going about your activities, while you're cleaning your house, while you're going to get groceries once a week, by the way, because that's what you're supposed to do. While you are outside raking your lawn, you're pointing people to Jesus. Because the myth is that it's only for those that are paid, only for those that are, that are gifted, only for those that are talented, Jesus says, all power has been given to me, now go. Go. Go into the world in which you've been called and show the good news of Jesus. Point people to Jesus. Because that's what's important. That's what the Great Commission is about. Pointing people to him. So let's pray. And then we're going to sing another song. We're going to take a time for some prayer. And then we'll sing one last song and we'll be finished. For the morning. So let's pray together. Father, we're so grateful to you that you have given us the power to go, the power to live, the power to teach, the power to share, the power to point people to Jesus. A power that never stopped, a power that never was dulled, a power that is continually now, given to us by the, Lord, the Son Himself. So as we leave here today, Father, as we go about our journey, 
Perhaps it's in the, the quarantine of our own homes, or perhaps it's out in the morning of other activities. May we show Jesus. Point Jesus. Thank you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Jerry, Ken, David, would you guys do this in our next one? Allow them to know how they should 
lead our town into the future. And we pray for our mayor, or our, not the mayor, we pray for our premier, Doug Ford. We pray for him, Father, as he leads his government, and his government sets the standard for our, our, our province. We thank you for a man who has been very definitive and very solid on things, and he's turned around and he's been very defensive about other things, defending our borders against others coming in, making sure that people are getting treated properly. Thank you, Father, for the leadership that he has exhibited. We pray for him, Father, as he makes decisions. We pray that you would help him as he seeks the advice and wisdom of others around him. We pray that you would allow that him and his, and his team to want to make sure they're making good decisions for us as a province. And we also want to pray for our Prime Minister. I know it's easy at times, Father, to blame and to put, you know, put him down. Father, he's one that you've placed in leadership over us. So we pray for Justin Trio. We pray for his, his wife. Thank you that she has been recovered. We pray, Father, for his family. But we also pray for the leadership that he exhibited in this world. Thank you for his, his way that he's leading with very calm and compassionate uh, speeches every day. Been there for the people. Father, help us to be able to follow the leadership that has been set out by him and his team. Father, we thank you for good leaders that have been placed with us. And we pray for them. We pray, Father, especially, that as we continue on with these days, because we don't know how long this is going to end, we don't know when we're going to gather back in this room and spend the time together in worship. But we do know that you know. So we trust you. And we rest in you, knowing you are the one that has mapped out our days in front of us. You know how long COVID-19 is going to hang around and dog us. So we pray, Father, that you would give us the strength, the wisdom, that you would give us the integrity to stand and to do as we've been asked. We also ask, Father, that we would be continually be shining lights in our community. When people get down, we remind them who Jesus is. We remind them that you are in control, that you've been here before you know what's happening. We thank you for that. Thank you for your time that we can spend. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I think a fair, uh, a good song for us to end with tonight, today is Amazing Grace. Because the truth is, God's grace is amazing. And we have that with us as we celebrate the resurrection. Jerry, Ken, thank you for us.
folks for joining us this morning from your couches and your homes or your dining room tables, wherever you happen to be. We ask, your bless, ask God's blessing on you through the remainder of this day and the remainder of this week. Uh, just a reminder, we have nothing going on at the church this week. And we don't know when things will be going on. But do remember the things that are happening around our community. For the homeless, the gatherings of the homeless over the Harmony Inn as they are there. Pray for those that are doing that are joining about it. Remember these people. Remember one another. Call one another. It's always important. There are some things that are taking place virtually. On Tuesday at 2 o'clock in the afternoon, we have a virtual Bible study. I will include the link in this video or with the email with this video. So please, uh, if you'd like, let me know. We can include you in that as well. And also, we're going to have a little chit-chat tomorrow afternoon, or tomorrow, I should say. It's this afternoon at 7 p.m. Just a hangout, a virtual hangout. And again, the link is below here, and you can uh, join with us if you'd like to. It's no agenda, just sit and talk and catch up. So if you'd like to do that, please uh, join us and follow the link below. So let's, uh, let's take a few moments as we close our time together with prayer. Father, we're so grateful to you for what you've done. Thank you for your goodness. Thank you that we can gather together virtually over uh, airwaves and computer waves and all that sort of ways. Thank you that you are the, so, the center of our universe. Father, bring us peace. Bring us hope. Bring us patience as we need it for your coming week. And we know, Father, that you are going with us. For we don't go alone. We ask this all in Jesus' name. Thank you very much, friends. Have a good day.